A bird when it flies doesn't care about its size And airplanes even with their weight can soar across the skies From STEM to arts to sports we have traveled far Even though they said we wouldn't make it Do you know who we are? Meri kaya ke bed kuch alag se hai Na hai galat, na hai sahi Kudrat ke is intizam ka मैं हूँ खास तुम नहीं तुम नहीं मिल भी जाए अगर एक जन्म और फिर जी लूंगा मैं उसे सौ बार आसमां के पार आसमां के पार आसमां के पार के पार आसमां के पार आसमां के पार आसमां के पार आसमां के पार एवरीवन इज ब्लेस्ड ईच डिफरेंटली देन द रेस्ट बट वी ऑल हैव द जेस्ट टू लिव लाइफ टू द फुलेस्ट नो मैटर आवर एबिलिटी वी ऑल कैन रीच द लाइफ इन वेज पीपल कैन इमेजिन द ऑब्स्टिकल्स आर राइफ वी मे नॉट हैव वॉइसेस बट वी आर नॉट अन हर्ड Yes, we may seem trapped, but we are freer than birds. You may say we're cursed, but we're miracles in disguise. And you may try to put us down, but we will always rise. We will always rise. Always rise. Always rise. Kuch sapne bune aankhon ne, kuch apne chune raahon ne, kuch hasrete badne lagi, kuch chahte jagne lagi. Manzil hai reh gayi, khud b khud piche. चले आसमां के पास आसमां के पास आसमां के पास The renowned theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking once said, "My advice to other disabled people would be: concentrate on things your disability doesn't prevent you doing well, and don't regret the things it interferes with. Don't be disabled in spirit as well as physically." Hello, everyone. My name is Justin J. Sudhas, and I'm your host for today's Abilities Unlimited. A very hearty welcome to each of you. to the 9th edition of India Inclusion Summit 2020 India Inclusion Summit is a volunteer led initiative with a mission to make India inclusive every year this has been an opportunity for the community around inclusion to come together after 8 years being a physical event this year it's going digital spread across four different events across three different days Over the past three weeks, we've successfully had Resilient Me, India Inclusion Summit Youth, and Celebrating Inclusion. Today, it is my proud privilege to present to you the grand finale of the India Inclusion Summit 2020, Ability Unlimited, where we acknowledge and bring together the community around inclusion, the corporates, social entrepreneurs, and NGOs. and now it is time for us to kick off the 2020 ability unlimited india inclusion summit with an inspiring performance by miracle on wheels which is india's first inclusive therapeutic dance theater promoting abilities of the differently able people inspiring and transforming the lives by giving dignity equality empowerment through dance theater and skill education presenting to you miracles on wheels
ability. The difference is how we use it. As a society, when we celebrate ability, the possibilities are infinite. To know the reality of ourselves, 
we must be aware not only of our conscious thoughts but also of our unconscious bias prejudices and habits every now and then we come across people who break stereotypes and make us realize of our clouded judgments in 2009 justin jesudas met with a car accident that left him paralyzed neck downwards a condition that anyone would otherwise believe being bedridden and confined to four walls 10 years on justin is an international para swimming champion with host of gold medals ranked in top 15 in the 2015 ipc world swimming championship glasgow and in the top 5 at the para asian games jakarta He is also a two-time national shooting champion and alumnus of the prestigious Global Sports Mentoring Program, a US government sports diplomacy exchange program. He juggles this aspect of his life with a full-time job and most recently, Justin quit his two-decade corporate career to work in the disability and social space. Justin is a father of beautiful pair of twins and lives a colorful life. When a car accident in 2009 left me paralyzed neck downwards I was staring at two choices either to crib complain and be the victim of the circumstances or be the hero of my life and script my own story I chose the latter and that made all the difference 10 years on despite such a severe disability I now travel around the world by myself drive a hand operated car to long distances do beach surfing and I'm a certified professional scuba diver apart from being an elite athlete representing india at international championships and yet doing a full time job the first year and a half was a challenge and as they say all things are difficult before becoming easy the first reaction to a situation like this is to ask why me i consciously steer away from this attitude because i never asked why me when i had a high flying career when i had a promotion or when i bought a car So why ask now? The hope and longing to walk again was there despite knowing the prognosis for spinal cord injury is always poor. Fortunately, I had a great family that became the hands and legs I didn't have. After a year and a half, it hit me so hard. There were two startling realizations. One was, why am I still focusing on things I can't control in my body? Why am I not focusing on my ability which are my head shoulders and biceps the second realization was being bedridden i wasn't living my life and my family wasn't living theirs they were 24 by 7 being around me i decided to work on my strengths started working out on my upper arms very religiously nothing changed overnight or over a week or in a month but in 3 months for the very first time i was able to get from my bed to wheelchair by myself using a transfer board Until then I was being lifted by 2 to 3 people. There on I started setting goals and started working towards them. 
A key milestone in this journey was in 2012 when I decided I will get to driving again no matter what. At that time, it sounded crazy with no control in my lower body and fingers not working. If at all I drive, I would have to use my shoulders and manipulate my non-performing assets like my palm and fingers. I got involved in researching and designing the adaptation for my car. If only you put your mind completely onto something and work towards it passionately, you'll be surprised with the results. I have now driven close to 100,000 kilometers, including long drives over 700 kilometers at a stretch. The table started turning really now and in a pleasant reversal of roles, I started taking my family out for shopping, outings, vacations, and from being completely dependent, we became interdependent. For me, it was a liberation of sorts. When I began to realize that I was getting functionally independent, I took to sports. In the beginning, it was only for fitness and swimming was an obvious but scary choice. Obvious as water takes care of the weight, keeps my body temperature at check, but scary because of the risk of drowning. I wasn't trained to swim before my accident. No finger control to hold on something was risky. I still remember the first day at the swimming pool. The lifeguards were perplexed, totally apprehensive. With a little persuasion there, I was in the pool, but with a floater. That was the condition the lifeguards put in. Of course, the floater did its job. The courage I rubbed onto the lifeguards to remove the floater shaped the competitive swimming journey that I had after that. Thereon, what seemed like eternity to go from one end to another end of the pool, from there on I picked up and started doing two kilometers every day in three months time. And that put the pathway for me to become an elite athlete. YouTube was my coach. I had no professional coach because they were not willing to train a 34 year, year old person. And two, they didn't understand what a neck downwards paralysis would be. From there on, there was no turning back. Goals at state and nationals, qualifying for all international champions, championships and then for the world championship, finishing in the top 15 at the Asian Games representing India and finishing in the top 5. I also picked up rifle shooting. The US government invited me for the foreign exchange diplomacy program. It all came along the way. If you ask me how I did all this, I didn't miss a day's training. Every day when I wake up, I had two choices. I can find reasons to disable myself and lie in the bed and start staring at the ceiling. Or I can find reasons to enable myself and seize the day. Of course, I chose the latter. My disability can be measured by the doctors, but my ability, nobody can measure. There is simply no limit for your abilities. We now have a panel that brings together stalwarts from the industry and NGOs to talk about how corporates, NGOs, and social entrepreneurs can bring their strength together in the space of disabilities. I'd like to introduce our moderator for the panel discussion, Rakesh Paladugula, who is a product manager at Adobe. Rakesh is a passionate accessibility specialist, advocate, and mentor known in the accessibility and disability space globally. Rakesh is a frequent speaker and panel member in many accessibility and disability events. He writes on his website, Maxibility. Thank you, Justin, for the warm introduction. We have truly inspiring and engaging panelists waiting to share their views today. Let me introduce them. Padmavati Srinivasan, our first panelist for the day. Padmavati Srinivasan was affected by polio when she is three months old and lost her mobility below neck. Despite of her socio-economic and physical challenges, she has completed her chartered accountancy, cost accountancy, and had a master's degree in psychology. She started her career practicing and worked at Standard Chartered Bank, and currently she is working in Barclays Shared Services as vice president for transfer pricing. She volunteers at various organizations, including one for preventing suicide, as she is a trained psychologist. We will hear more when she speaks. A warm welcome, Padmavati. Pradhana Pratik Kaul. Mrs. Pradhana Pratik Kaul is co-founder of Giftabled. Pradhana worked with IBM and iVolunteer. She is a cost marketer. 
motivational speaker and consultant for diversity and inclusion. Her contributions to the industry has won various awards and accolades, including Social Entrepreneur of the Year by Nama Bengaluru Foundation, Best Social Entrepreneur by Hand in Hand, Top 3 Social Entrepreneurs by IIM Kolkata Innovation Park. Great to have you here, Prathana. Welcome. Harish. Harish Hande is a social entrepreneur. He co-founded Selco India in 1995 after holding a PhD in energy engineering from the University of Massachusetts, Loyal. Later, he became the CEO of Selco Foundation in 2014. Harish won various awards, including the Ashoka Fellow in 2008, Max Essay in 2011, and the trustees of University of Massachusetts had awarded him the Doctorate of Humane Letters in 2011. It's our privilege to have you here, Harish. A warm welcome to you. We will be taking a few questions at the end of this session and please send them across to us. Our email address is indiainclusionsummit at gmail.com. So we will start our panel discussion. The first question I have is to Padmavati. Hi, Padma. One of the barriers for persons with physical challenges is infrastructure or our office premises. With the new normal work from home, I believe there is no infrastructure barriers as we are working from home in our own space. Do you have any inputs or thoughts on this? Uh, thank you, Rakesh, and uh, thank everyone uh, for uh, this opportunity. Um, see, my thoughts on this uh, would be, Rakesh, that yes, uh, you know, uh, with the new normal and the world has become uh, virtual, uh, it has opened uh, lots of doors uh, for uh, uh, people like us. Uh, and uh, definitely that's a very positive thing. But at the same time, working from home is um, causing quite a few of issues which I can share from my personal experience also. The first thing that I would like to say, the infrastructure setup that we have an office, like a proper chair and a proper uh, table, which is like, you know, there are tables which come with height adjustable things, which, which is not uh, possible to be installed at home. So, uh, and uh, because of that, uh, you know, we are having, getting a physical discomforts which uh, which is causing a lot of problems so that is one thing that is causing an issue and the second thing is the long hours of work like you know uh, as everyone who are in the corporate world would agree the line between work and home has become very thin and that you know where work stops where home starts is becoming a questionable thing these days so because of that you continue to sit for a long period of time you don't take brief breaks where in office you would just like to go for a coffee and then take a walk you know have conversations etc so those physical discomforts are definitely causing an issue so which uh, i think whether everyone can be uh, can replicate an office environment at home is something that is uh, that is a very questionable thing because i know somebody a few colleagues of mine who live in a very small house who are not even able to put a proper chair and table in their uh, in their home so these are difficulties uh, but uh, the, something that maybe corporates can uh, think about and come up with uh, some kind of a solution to make even a work uh, environment uh, more uh, user friendly for people uh, uh, who are differently abled and uh, the second thing is on the mental thing like you know uh, for uh, uh, mental in terms of work stress and not meeting people and talking to colleagues sharing things is also kind of uh, causing and uh, some issues um, because uh, we are by na nature we are uh, you know humans are bound to uh, you know, be more comfortable when we meet people, talk people, etc. And uh, that is also kind of uh, resulting in mental stress and all that. I know every corporate is taking a lot of steps in terms of mental well-being also, but how, how comfortable we are talking about it is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, so yeah. these are the constraints that I think is possible. Thank you, Padma. Uh, that that uh, holistically covered uh, uh, different aspects of life and also uncovered uh, the myth that um, 
timing is is most important and where you cut off the work work and where the home life starts thanks for that insightful information harish now i have the question for you after listening at padmavati's conversation is it the lack of awareness or the drawback of uh, implementation that corporates are not able to provide a 360 degrees work from home or reasonable accommodations uh, otherwise uh, for people with disabilities what do you think on that lines thanks rakesh and thanks padma for putting that perspective in place uh, more so rakesh i'll also challenge uh, i'll put another challenge see again work from home uh, is a luxury for men what happens to the lot of blacksmith blowers or silk weavers or sewing machine or and if you look at the 45% of the population that is poor who do their livelihoods basic of physical labor or you can't talk to a farmer and say we are going to work from home or a, or a street vendor can work from home or a or a silk weaver or a or a or a person who is done working on sewing machine there are a lot of people who are who are challenged uh, today uh, who are brilliant intellectually extremely brilliant i mean may, may not have the complete physical abilities that typical human beings have but there are hardly any facilities for them and 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 it's been a it's been a disaster in many ways for for that population so i think we need to be more more inclusive in our thought process in terms of our innovations we should be inclusive in our way we look at uh, the even the rest 40% of the population that is underserved in many ways and i think uh, we need to the and i type of products or type of opportunities today yes the people who if there is a uh, education and the corporates who are doing it that means you're going to always believe that such people can only work for them and i i create a certain facility in my office how do i now inspire people to be in, be innovators to be entrepreneurs why can't they start their own corporates why can't they start innovating where are the opportunities that we are creating for them i think that's where my push our push is towards are we truly creating an ecosystem that is inclusive for any person to come and innovate incubate and start their own corporate i think that's where we need to the society that starts stopping and 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 i see in the rural and the semi rural areas the the opportunities are much more dismal and and how can we change it by thinking more inclusively it's not about processes but also how we change the thinking process to be little more inclusive in that innovations to happen and and that uh, and rather than romantically looking at i'm going to help people nobody wants any help how do we create an ecosystem where people all help themselves so and uh, removing that romantic that we are charity and all that is but thinking more inclusively is where the society needs to change right that's wonderful a way of putting harish i really like the way you narrated the inclusive thought process is something which has to be inculcated in the organizations and the people who work in the organization and yeah as you said the rural and the semi rural areas and the underprivileged 40% of the underprivileged uh, is where you need to invest more and understand how we can enable them to be um, helping each other rather than uh, relying on the help from the corporates or other organizations thank you so much for that insightful information pratna let me come to you now who heard pradmavati and harish talking about their perspectives do you think organizations like gift table can come closer to uh, bridge that gap which the organization and the people uh, organizations are currently doing and uh, where people with disabilities uh, will be able to use their fullest potential i am sure there is a gap that has to be filled in mm. um, do you think the organizations like gift table can bridge that certainly uh, uh, rakesh and that's a very valid question in fact uh, i would say pandemic has taught us to think in different way uh, especially i remember when uh, covid lockdown started we were among those first few organizations we completely moved to virtual within two weeks time uh, we didn't even wait like you know uh, i i was not sure how much how long will uh, will it take Uh, but you won't believe within last couple of months we were able to have around 3000 volunteers sign up from different corporates uh, just to volunteer their time uh, uh, you know we could have a digital library set up where we now have thousands of stories that could be heard by visually impaired across the world 
uh, not just that i had like around 500 plus signups where people now can uh, actually start communicating with deaf in sign language i still remember almost 13 years back when i learned sign language and i used to meet any deaf i used to be fully excited and you know i used to go and say hey hi my name is p r a r t h a n a and the immediate response i used to get was are you deaf and i was like no is someone in your family deaf and i was like no why because you are signing so for them it was like if you are signing you are not part of that community like you know you must be uh, having some reason for learning sign language and we wanted to change that notion when we started giftable and i still remember one day one volunteer posting saying hey i learned alphabets in sign language i see a pottery artist who is deaf uh, in mg road uh, bangalore and i just go and i said let me try uh, my name and she goes and says hi my name is alekya and the response she got was are you volunteer giftable now uh, giftable is just one such organization uh, there are so many such organization doing amazing work um, and if corporates like harish rightly said it's about ecosystem right everyone coming together and bringing in that change Uh, we need not be next to the beneficiary to bring in that change i sitting here today i am working with acid attack victims who are in uh, north india or i am working with artist with disability in kashmir as well as in north karnataka right in maharashtra so it is possible just that what we need to do is understand and quickly move to the virtual world uh, we were able to do trainings vocational trainings for with support of partner ngos in rural areas Uh, like uh, like harish said right you know uh, partners uh, farmers can't become and become virtual the lot of 70% of our population is in rural area and organized sector can at the most hire 1% of people with disability what happens to the rest of population correct so today uh, we can proudly say you know last month we had this um, order from cisco where they said hey we want to recognize 900 employees sitting in 900 different locations now imagine we getting in touch with korea partner and delivering those products made by people with disability to 900 different locations supporting livelihood of so many people with disability right and that's the role uh, uh, right. organizations like giftable can surely play awesome and and definitely that i agree the chain system of uh, working with the organizations yes. and getting on to the most rural parts and which is very much close to my heart i being a person who uh, hail from a rural part of andhra pradesh right definitely uh, value value the importance of bringing the upskill in, in the rural areas thank you very much exactly. for that information prathna thank you um so let me now come to each one of you with a question and i would like to get that answered in a sentence um and let me start with harish how can the organizations or our colleagues can make the workplace inclusive what is one thing that comes to your mind oh, the one thing that comes is thinking i mean i don't even i mean if i am talking to anybody i i mean i'm talking i'm going to fight with anybody or going to praise or work with, I, with absolutely no doesn't matter what disabilities or what the last name on which religion and what caste i think if we can break that barrier uh, and if that comes from the education system uh, and as if i'm so that's where I, it's the thinking for me it's pure and simple is thinking everything else will follow awesome. and as long as we kill that thinking process what do you say padma is there a way you think organizations and uh, our colleagues can make our workplace inclusive uh, sensitizing people is the one thing that comes to my mind uh, rakesh so, you know that's great the, the starting of the... off yeah that's the beginning for everything wonderful yeah. what do you say prarthana i would say believe and become an advocate when uh, we keep hearing like you know i want to be an ally and i think that's the message be an ally uh, everything is possible like each one of us can do some little things and create that larger impact uh thank you very much for all the panelists for sharing your views before we got get, go to the q and a i have one question uh, for you padma when you are applying for a job what is the first thing that comes to your mind that i am very much curious to know that uh the first thing that would come to my mind is the accessibility of the place where i'm going to attend the interview uh, rakesh because how i will reach and whether i'll be able to climb 
get inside the building, whether the chair in which I'm going to sit and attend the interview is going to be comfortable. All those things are the first things that come to my mind. So because again, this is from personal experience, I've faced many challenges. So that's the thing that comes that's to my mind. That's very true. And I, I, I totally agree because for many of us who don't uh, know about or think about disability, all that we think of is what is the question or what are the questions that the interviewer is going to ask me, am I going to get this job or not? But for persons with disabilities, it is about the infrastructure. Am I able to properly go? Or are they going to help me with the reasonable accommodations during the interview? Am I able to uh, have a comfortable chair to so that I can concentrate on the questions, etc.? And I that's very much true. Uh, thanks for your uh, sharing your experience, Padma. We have come to the end of this session today. Thank you very much, Pratna, Harish, and Padma for sharing your views today. Thank you so much. Back to you, Justin. Thank you, Rakesh, Harish, Pratna, and Padmavati. Now, I want to introduce you to a new member of the IIS family. He is indeed one of our true spokespersons for inclusion. Hi, hello. <laughs> My name is Inclu. Every name has a meaning, and Inclu is short for inclusion. Do you know what inclusion is? It's a very special word. Inclusion means when everyone is valued and accepted for who they really are. Respect for everyone from all walks of life. Just like Namaste means sharing respect to everyone you meet. He is Inclusion, our new mascot for the India Inclusion Summit. We will be meeting him again. It is now time for a small quiz where 10 winners have the opportunity to win IIS 2020 t-shirts. To join the quiz, you have to either click on the link below the video or scan the QR code that is displayed. Let me repeat this again. I would want all of you to join us on this quiz where you can win IIS 2020 t-shirts. And all you have to do to join the quiz is to click on the link below the video or scan the QR code that is displayed. Hurry, let us test your inclusion mojo. And while you're acing the quiz, we want to take you through a special initiative that India Inclusion Foundation had been driving to offer a platform for our young social innovators in the space of inclusion. And to talk about that, we have one of the architects and guru for this initiative, Anshu Gupta. Anshu needs a little introduction. Popularly known as the clothing man, Anshu, who started as a freelance journalist, left a corporate job in 1998 and founded Gunj with a mission to making clothing a matter of concern and to bring it among the list of subjects for development sector. An Ashoka fellow and global ambassador, Anshu is creating a mass movement for recycling and reuse of tons of waste material by channelizing it from the cities to villages as a resource for rural development. I now invite Anshu to take us through the India Inclusion Fellow Program. So every time I come for India Inclusion Summit, I, I uh, say that I go much, uh, go back much richer. Uh, such a such a beautiful forum, and uh, in this forum, you know, where people from all walks of life come, meet each other, get strength from each other, get uh, learn from each other, and. In the, in the process, uh, this in India Inclusion, uh, in the process of India Inclusion Summit, this uh, fellowship was started, say, so this is the fifth year, 2016 we started and when, uh, you know, I was uh, connected by, uh, when I was contacted by Feroz to, to chair this fellowship, I actually, to be honest, I thought maybe I'm not eligible for it, uh, but then I just took it as a, as a learning opportunity because every year you, you end up meeting such beautiful people such beautiful doers in this space which uh, I think I didn't know enough I even today don't know enough but it's still learning from the people uh, 2016 we started the whole idea was that we choose uh, the doers as as fellows uh, in this particular domain 
in any case we do not have uh, enough people uh, you know we we need many many more people many many more organization because a large part of the disability is still very hidden uh, still there is there is you know like in the menstrual hygiene space when we work uh, we always say there is a shame of there is there's a culture of shame and silence so somewhere in this space also uh, in the in the aam janta in the common people it is the case this needs to open up and and when these uh, many institutions many newcomers get into this and adopt it and and work on it obviously a lot of new uh, activities new work happen so 2016 we started and uh, now with this current batch of 8 there are 32 fellows very uh, in in a very detailed process these people are chosen uh, and the best part is that the fellows choose fellows i mean we are there you know at the uh, on the outer boundary of it but fellows really take a lot of uh, effort this year also again uh, fellows took a lot of effort and they you know from a, from a pool of 60 fellows eight are chosen uh, very carefully the most beautiful part of this particular fellowship uh, this year's fellowship is that we literally have fellows from uh, say kashmir to kanyakumari and kolkata to vadodara so although there are only eight fellows but geographically we have been able to cover a lot and idea wise also we have been able to cover a lot these fellows go through a very rigorous process of uh, talking to each other learning from each other for about a year and then uh, it used to culminate in the uh, this this particular summit this uh, this particular year we will be doing it for 9 months and uh, then uh, one week very intense which is a part of uh, this fellowship program where we bring people from all walks of life in terms of how to shape up the organization how to learn from each other how do we really uh, work together in this space my uh, congratulations to all the all the fellows and all the people who are listening all the people who have who have, you know who are who are attending you know this this uh, annual uh, event annual uh, you know few days of learning annual meeting or whatever we want to say which we all uh, look forward to all the best thank you very much Hi, my name is Aman Prasing Chopra. I'm Shweta Runwal from Pune. I'm Suraj Santosh Kumar. My name is Ashwath. This is Shamita. I'm, I'm Tiffany Brown. My name is Tarek Ahmed Mir. Hai. My name is Padmini Chenna Pratika. In our country, out of the total population of the deaf, only one percent have access to quality education. This is where to fill this gap in learning. We come into the picture. We are building an interactive game-based learning platform for the deaf kids. that will also act as a teaching aid for the teachers in special schools and will act as a home reinforcement tool for the parents at their home people with special need get categorized by the a b c d e products a agarbatti b basket bags candles chocolates diyas envelopes tickle your art is a social enterprise and it aims at bridging this gap when art made by self advocates are integrated to make high end personal and lifestyle products at tickle your art we are starting with emphasizing inclusion through our products and be a familiar name in indian homes and hearts we believe the key to inclusion lies in breaking down communication barriers and that's exactly what we set out to do at sign talk we're building a gamified language learning platform to learn the indian sign language our vision is to use learn isl and to give people a simple and fun experience while they're learning the language Our focus area is on livelihood, health, and education for persons with disability and marginalized community. Our mission is to bring an ecosystem with the help of person with disability as a change agent. Through this ecosystem, we are bringing possibilities for people with disability and their family, and reduce the barriers for their individual growth. Zenica designs clothes. around people's uh, physical needs and challenges and it makes the 
clothes easy and quick to wear and as independently as possible so it really gives people the right to choose and empowers them hamari organization differently able logon ke banaye hue products jo shawls tools scarf sarees wagaira hain produce karte hain hamari organization banane ka maqsad ye tha ki विकलांग लोगों को सोसाइटी में बराबर का हिस्सा नहीं मिलता था और जब वो कोई काम करते थे बीच में उनका जो मिडल मैन होता था वो उसकी ज़्यादा पैसा खा रहा था तो उस चीज़ को ख़त्म करने के लिए हमने डायरेक्ट उनके प्रोडक्ट को मार्केट तक लाने की कोशिश की है हाउ कैन वी यूज स्पोर्ट्स एज अ टूल फॉर डेवलपमेंट टू एडवांस डिजेबिलिटी राइट टूडे विदाउट इन्वेस्टिंग any money we have been able to educate a community of persons with disabilities in india who themselves are reaching out to people in the last mile villages of the country and uh, so as an evolving organization we are focused on advancing disability rights using research education and advocacy as um, our primary tools i am blind so what i have many other capabilities and through my initiative the Jodhpur Gamaya Foundation i wish other blind people also to focus on their capabilities not on their disabilities i started as a mobile blind school going from door to door in search of blind people bringing them out of the four walls of their houses empowering them instilling in them confidence training them in technology in all its latest forms Thank you Anshu and congratulations to all our inclusion fellows. We wish you more power to drive change and keep your spirits high. A truly inclusive India and world needs more people like you. Meanwhile, we have Miracle on Wheels back again for you.
that would have surely kept everyone's spirits high. We are now moving overseas to the next segment with Nadine Ogal, founder and CEO of the Springboard Foundation in conversation with Jim Sinochi, who heads the Office of Disability Inclusion at J.P. Morgan Chase. Jim Sinochi is the head of disability inclusion at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. In this role, Sinochi works closely with senior leaders across J.P. Morgan Chase to establish consistent standards and processes to better support employees with disabilities. He's an ex-IBMer with expertise in management, marketing and communication, media relations, employee engagement, crisis communications, diversity and disability inclusion. Nadine O. Vogel is the CEO of Springboard Global Enterprises, which is home to Springboard Consulting, Disability Mama, the WIP Group and the Springboard Foundation, which is an affiliated charity. Springboard Consulting works with corporations around the world to mainstream people with disabilities in the global workforce, workplace and marketplace. They also produce the world-renowned Disability Matters Conference and Awards Gala. Hi, I'm Nadine Vogel. I'm CEO of Springboard Global Enterprises. Springboard works with corporations all around the world to mainstream people with disabilities in the workforce, the workplace, and the marketplace. I am really excited to be here with all of you today, and even more so about the person that I'm going to be sharing the stage with. Jim? Hi, how are you? I'm Jim Sinaki from J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm head of disability inclusion uh, worldwide. Thank you. So I'd like to start off, Jim, by asking you a question. Um, how do you think companies could become employers of choice for people with disabilities? Obviously, that doesn't happen overnight. There's a process. But what would be some guidance you'd like to give companies? Well, it has to be a deliberate decision. It's not something you do in terms of, let me join the pack and do disability inclusion. You really need a full commitment because there's more involved than just hiring people. It, it says you got to hire qualified people to work at your place of work as, as for J.P. Morgan Chase. It's a bank uh, which has many job roles, but it's basically a financial institution. Number two is you have to have the leadership to make the investments in terms of getting the right people there, uh, setting up an organization that has the infrastructure to support people who are different. In, in the case of people with disabilities, it has to do with, are you gonna have a program to help deliver accommodations? Are you gonna have a program to ensure your accessibility of your technology is enabled for everyone? Um, finally, uh, do you have a plan for um, assimilation of these folks who are joining your, your company and making sure that they can avail themselves of all you have to offer in terms of work and career growth and how to get there. So there's a lot to think about. It's nothing, it's not a thing that you wake up and say, hey, we're just gonna do this, right? It has to be planned. Absolutely, it's, it's about organizational readiness. Um, you know, at Springboard, we work with companies and, and conduct these organizational assessments and gap analysis to help a company understand that path that you're speaking to, that cross-functional path that they're gonna have to take to ensure that they're ready to do this successfully and sustainably. But you know, there's so many different directions for, for an organization to go. So if you think about disability as it relates to culture, relates to employment, what do you think is next on the horizon? I think, uh, I, I think it takes time, look, our society today is still going through issues around race, gender, identity, disability, and, and, and you name it, you know, what foods to eat, tofu. I mean, there's always a debate about things, but I, I think most people have to get over uh, their fears about, number one, offending people or not being sure um, how to accept people who are different. Um, and that takes 
you know, some getting used to. And that's why policies, education, training, engaging with people who are different, um, trying to get to know each other. You know, what's the etiquette when you go talk to a blind person? Right. What's the etiquette when you try to speak with a deaf person Absolutely. who maybe reads lips or doesn't? Do you have the technology to enable that? Do you have captioning in your organization? And so, uh, you know, it can be a seamless process to be able to hire people with disabilities, but it also takes some work on the foundational side of the business to say, yeah, uh, you know, I'm going to admit that you have to deliver accommodations uh, to people with various abilities. If you're deaf, you need a certain kind of accommodation, such as captioning or interpreters. If you're mobility impaired, you may need automatic doors in a building or ramps or elevators. Um, if you have blind clientele, you want to make sure your elevators have Braille uh, as appropriate or training on how to approach a blind person to give them assist assistance. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's a natural fit, but it can be done with um, etiquette, politeness, compassion, and being eager to embrace a model that uh, is inclusive. Absolutely. It's about respect, right? It's about respect for individuals and respect for difference. Um, you know, when we talk about accommodations or reasonable adjustments, I mean, my older daughter has significant disabilities, but actually does not require accommodations in the workplace. Yet, because of the way she looks, assumptions are made about the fact that she would. And so, again, I think it comes back to what you were saying is, you know, ask questions, be respectful, you know, have the etiquette. I, I always say we're people first. The disability may be a, a, you know, a big part of who we are, but it should not define us. It's just a piece of, and I think that if folks understand that, that'll go a long way. When we think about leaders, I find that organizations have a, an imagination, a visual of what a leader looks like, right? Um, I'm not sure that everyone's thinking about people with disabilities as leaders. We tend to focus on entry level positions, part-time positions, how do we bring them in? And now, like you said earlier, it's a process. We're not gonna get there overnight. But I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to how we can imagine people with disabilities in leadership positions as we go through this journey. I, I think that's a great question. I've thought about it quite a bit. Um, I sit in a, in a wheelchair every day. I've, I've done it for 30 years. Um, I would like to walk again and be my old healthy self. Um, I'm still healthy. I just can't walk around. Um, but the point is, as disabled people, we have to understand who we are and how we look or represent ourselves to other people. The disabled population also has a responsibility to bridge that gap or bridge the bond between us and the able-bodied uh, uh, population in order to get them to acknowledge us as number one, knowledgeable about what we do. Mm -hmm. And we too have to have poise in terms of being leaders or uh, trying to get to a leadership position. Mm -hmm. How do we position ourselves to have people uh, think of us as a leader. How does anybody get assessed? Able-bodied, a woman, or a black, a Hispanic, or anybody uh, figure out how they could be a leader in an organization. I, I, I will attest to the fact that the process is the same in, in all our minds in terms of knowledge of a certain topic. How do you relate to other people? How do you uh, gain confidence of someone else to take your advice or decision to go forward. How do you get people to follow you? Right, right. It's, a, it's another uh, point that even able-bodied have to deal with. In the military, you get a rank. You're a lieutenant, a sergeant, a captain, a general. Whoa, that person has status, so he must know more than we do and we've got to lead. It's the same thing in business. If you're a manager, an executive, a managing director, a vice president, a chairman, you're a leader, but people follow you because of 
what you help the business accomplish, what you help people accomplish. So it's almost an illusion in terms of our bodies, you know, representing leadership, but it's really all in our minds, how we think about ourselves on each other. Do you care about people? Um, do you look out for other people's goodwill? Those are the, some of the attributes of a leader. You know, you know, let's say you have the business acumen, but what do you have on the people side, on the relationship side? So people with disabilities have to learn to carry themselves that way um, as well. And I, I think we're more similar than different, but our humanity uh, does two things. It either brings us together or it'll keep us apart. And we see that on so many levels. <laughs> I think so. I, I, right? Um, uh, I look forward to having more conversations. I want to thank everyone for allowing Jim and I to present and share with you today. And we wish you a wonderful rest of your event. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Nadine, for your thoughts on how driving inclusion at workplace. As a quadriplegic myself, I absolutely appreciate Jim's insights to creating inclusion and workplace equity. I'm sure a lot of corporates would have benefited from Jim's valuable insights. We now move on to the next segment to hear about technology for inclusion, for which I introduce Dr. Sujata Srinivasan. Sujata Srinivasan is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and heads the TTK Center for Rehabilitation Research and Device Development at IIT Madras. Her research focuses on applying mechanism design and movement biomechanics to develop functional and affordable assistive rehabilitation devices for people with movement disability. Professor Sujata has nearly 30 years of experience in her field, including eight years in the US industry. She's a 1992 alumna of IIT Madras and joined its faculty in 2008. She has co-authored over 50 refereed journal and conference publications and is co-inventor of 29 patents. She's also the founder of Neomotion, a startup on assistive devices incubated at IIT Madras. Thank you, Justin, for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here as part of the India Inclusion Summit uh, 2020. And my thanks to my friend, uh, Feroz for this opportunity. R2D2 stands for Rehabilitation Research and Device Development. So I head uh, that center uh, at IIT Madras. And today I'd like to share with you the work that we are doing on technology for inclusion. If you look at the landscape of assistive devices uh, in India and abroad, on the one hand, you have very primitive technologies but they're very low cost. And that's typically what is available to most people in India. At the other end of the spectrum, you have very high tech devices. Many of them have not even made the transition from the lab to the market. And even if they are available, they are extremely expensive. And uh, 
very few people can afford them. Uh, so as a result, they are also not that easily accessible to people with disabilities. So there really is a big space in the middle, uh, uh, many challenges where we can try to create more functional devices, which are still affordable. And that is the space that we work in. Even when you have the right technology, even when you have the appropriate assistive device, there are challenges to making an impact. Affordability is number one because many people disadvantaged once they have a disability. And so the economics of the device play a large part in whether they have, uh, they're able to get one. Awareness is also lacking. Um, many people don't know what is the right kind of assistive device for them, um, how to get it uh, fit properly so that they can make the most of it. So these are challenges in awareness. Access. How do you make these assistive devices available to everyone who needs them? That's another mm -hmm. challenge. And ultimately, acceptance of the device by the user uh, is absolutely essential for them to be able to make the most of it and for them to become contributing members of uh, society. And here in this slide, I use um, glasses, eyeglasses, because we forget, we tend to forget that eyeglasses are also an assistive device. And yet they are so accepted, uh, they are easy to uh, access by and large. And you know, nobody would say a one size fits all for uh, eyeglasses. We know that it has to be customized to us. So there are lots of aspects of fitting eyeglasses that actually apply to all assistive uh, devices. And as far as acceptance, I mean, eyeglasses are considered a style statement. Uh, not just an assistive device. So how do we do this with all assistive devices? To address affordability at R2D2, we use what is known as the grid collaboration model. Uh, we have four pillars of this model. G stands for the grant, which either comes from government uh, or private CSR funding or foundations which fund the research that we do. And they have a genuine interest to create social impact. R is the nodal research institution like ours, where we are focused on development, you know, scientific with a scientific basis, with a focus on the function, not the bottom line. And I stands for industry partners. They could be established industries which are willing to work with us, or it could be a startup. Again, they have an incentive to work in this model because a lot of their R&D costs are covered by the grant giving agency and the research institution's resources. D stands for the dissemination partners who are critical across the entire development cycle. Uh, for uh, They provide us the feedback from the early stages of the device development to ensure that the final product that we come up with is something that the users really want. These are also partners who will help us reach out to users after the device is developed to ensure market penetration. Our first success story with the grid model has been the Arise standing wheelchair. In, for the development of Arise, the Wellcome Trust provided the grant. Phoenix Medical Systems in Chennai was our industry partner. Uh, and R2D2 brought all these partners together. For dissemination, we had individual users, uh, rehab centers, hospitals like CMC Bellow, the Association for People with Disability, Spinal Foundation, Amar Seva Sangam, a number of play partners, dissemination partners, who helped with the development of this device. I'll now play a video of Arise, which will tell you a little bit more about how the device works. So Arise is a wheelchair with an integrated standing mechanism. It was developed to um, address the problems associated with prolonged sitting for wheelchair users. Uh, after about five years of development, it was la launched last November, um, in November 2019, uh, with our industry partner, Phoenix Medical Systems. And it's a wheelchair that enables the person to shift from the sitting to the standing position by themselves with their own effort without any external support. It enables them to be more functional, and it's also suitable for outdoor use and on uneven terrains. Uh, so the idea is to improve not just uh, the functionality, but also the uh, psychological uh, 
uh, aspect, uh, the benefits of standing provide those to wheelchair users. One of the most moving moments, the usage of Arise was during the launch when we played the national anthem and the Arise uh, wheelchair users were also able to stand for the national anthem. And it was very emotional for them as well. And for all of us, because for many of them, it was the first time they were able to stand for the national anthem after their injury. Some of them after many years. Typically, when we think of a wheelchair, we think one size fits all. But just like the eyeglasses I mentioned, that is so not true. So we have a startup from our lab incubated at IIT Madras called Neo Motion that has addressed this problem. So they have created these two products, NeoFly and NeoBolt. NeoFly is a fully personalized wheelchair that is prescribed after taking into account the person's health, lifestyle, and needs environment. And NeoBolt is a very unique add-on that uh, it's a motorized add-on that converts this wheelchair into an outdoor mobility device. So it eliminates the need to transfer to another uh, device in order to go outdoors. And I let the video uh, speak for itself. My friend was falling down from 2011 because of my body paralysis. इस बिल्चर प्रयोग करने के बाद आसानी से हम कहीं भी जा सकते हैं आ सकते हैं हम लगभग एक चाल से काम कर रहे हैं इस प्रोजेक्ट पे It's the best India designed wheelchair that I've sat on in 27 years. पहले हम wheelchair से हम जो मराठन करते थे उसमें बहुत ज़्यादा समय लगता था इस wheelchair के प्रयोग करने के बाद timing है वो बहुत कम हो गया एक गाड़ी आती है जो कि इस wheelchair में आसानी से हम set कर सकते हैं और गाड़ी set करने के बाद हम आसानी से बाहर जा सकते हैं कम स्पेस में जा सकते हैं और कहीं भी पार्किंग कर सकते हैं और समय का बचत हो सकता है क्योंकि अगर हम ओनली व्हीलचेयर यूज करते हैं तो हमारी समय ज़्यादा लग सकता है बट वो गाड़ी जब सेट करने के बाद आसानी से हम जा सकते हैं एक स्थान से दूसरे स्थान और जो कि उसमें पूरा स्ट्रॉन्ग है मजबूत है गाँव में चला सकते हैं अगर गड्ढे ऊँचे नीचे हैं तो आसानी से चला सकते हैं अभी हमको कोई डर नहीं है हम कहीं भी जा सकते हैं this was also developed uh, using the grid model. For this uh, project, we had funding from the government, from the Imprint India program. Subsequently, we've had uh, CSR funding from HDFC and now the Tata Group. Again, you know, the development and uh, the success of this product really depends on our dissemination partners, the involvement of the users from the early stages of uh, development. User-centric design, is the first step towards acceptance. When users are involved in the design, the designers have a better idea of what they really want. And through that, we are able to build products that make the users feel good about using the product. When it looks good, when it's of good quality, when it is functional, then it enables better access to education, to employment, to societal participation. And when users see that their needs are being met, the chances of acceptance are so much greater. And that is what we need to aim for. Uh, empowerment comes from the acceptance of the device so that you reduce the stigma that's associated with using the device and instead focus on how it enables the user to be a productive member of society. So that is the vision of R2D2. Our goal is to work with all our partners. We have partnerships with various NGOs, medical institutions, rehab centers, uh, other academic institutions. We hope more industries come forward to partner with us to take our devices to market. We hope more startups come forward and uh, uh, take some of these assistive devices to the market. Uh, and we are very grateful for all the support we have received in the form of grants from various sources for whom the impact has been what mattered. And we are very grateful uh, to all of them for enabling us to do our work. And with these partnerships, we really hope to change the assistive device landscape in India to enable inclusion uh, through technology. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Sujata Srinivasan. As a wheelchair user myself, assistive devices have played a huge role in my functional independence. 
I wish Neo Motion the very best. India Inclusion Summit has been known to showcase unsung heroes and provide a unique platform for people with disabilities. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our unsung hero, Karthik Dubai from Chennai, whose story is something beyond spectacular. 20-year-old Karthik Kumar can sing in Tamil, Hindi, Malayalam, Punjabi, Marathi, Telugu, English, and Arabic, play keyboards, guitar, and tabla, and has committed over 2,000 songs to memory. What makes these accomplishments more remarkable is the fact that he is autistic. Despite the disorder, having restricted his communication skills, comprehension, and social interaction with the outside world, it has not affected his passion for music. Oh, 
Thank you, Karthik, for those melodious songs and looking forward to seeing you spreading more joy to others. Now, we have something which all of you have been waiting for, the winners for the quiz. For those of you who are curious about the answers, the answer for the first question is 85%. Only 15% of disabilities are visible, of which only 2% concern people in wheelchairs. For the second question, dyslexia was a disability for the child in Tare Zaminpur. Do you know that Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, had dyslexia? Edison's inventions include the electric light bulb and the motion picture. So was Tom Cruise, the famous actor. He never finished high school, although he had the ability to memorize his lines and perform on both the stage and screen. And the answer to the third question was Gujarish, where Hrithik Roshan played the role of a former magician who is a quadriplegic. Thank you all for the active participation. The IAS team will be reaching out to all the winners. Watch out in your emails. Now it is time for us to move to one of our highlights for today, where we have IAS co-founder VR Feroz in conversation with Windsurf, the father of internet, and Rishad Premji, the chairman of Wipro. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the final session of the India Inclusion Summit. Uh, I am delighted to have uh, two absolute legends in the technology field, both of whom I am very pleased to say as, uh, as not just collaborators in, uh, in my journey, but also dear friends. And maybe the only silver lining of COVID has been that I'm able to get both Windsurf and Rishad PMG at the India Inclusion Summit virtually. I can tell you I've been chasing them for many years to be part of the summit, but maybe uh, in a virtual mode, uh, we've had the time to do this uh, for the first time. Um, and before we get into uh, a more detailed conversation, a very brief introduction, both of them don't need one, but I would still try to make it uh, uh, very brief for the audience. Uh, Windsurf is one of the fathers of the internet along with Bob Khan. Uh, he's seen almost 50 years of internet and I'm very keen to know what his take has been and what does he see as the next 50 years. Um, so, Wint, thank you so much for being part of the India Inclusion Summit. I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And Rishad is a very dear friend. Um, I first met him when he was selected as a young global leader, and I very proudly claim that I'm one of his mentors at YGL. Uh, but more than that, he's, of course, a very dear friend and uh, the chairman of uh, Wipro, a role that he took over in July 2019. So, Rishad, Thank you so much for taking the time to be part of the summit. I'm very keen to know how this a little over one and a half years has been for you. I'm sure this has been, uh, you know, uh, an interesting, but also a challenging time, right? Yeah. So first of all, Feroz, thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here and to be with you, Vint, as well. Um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting uh, roller coaster ride, uh, to, say the, to say the least, over the last uh, 15 months, you know. Um, I took over and we've just been through obviously COVID, which has been something that everybody has experienced differently. And then we've also been through a, a, a CEO reorganization. Uh, our CEO left us in January and we had a new CEO join us, uh, Thierry Delaporte in July. And so I was playing a much more 
active and hands-on role for, uh, for, for several months. So I, I joke with people and I say, you know, if I can get some of the tough stuff out in the first year of this new job, then hopefully things can look better from here. But look, it's, it's, um, so it's been an ex exciting, interesting, challenging uh, 15 months, but I also feel very blessed, very blessed to have this opportunity uh, to take over on this platform, very proud of the organization that has been built and uh, proud not only for what we've accomplished in terms of performance, but really having built an organization on a bedrock of uh, very, very high integrity and strong governance, which just becomes a great launch pad from which to do exciting things as we move into this new phase and new age of technology. So it's, 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 it's predominant of being really, really humbled and blessed and really excited as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rishad. So maybe I'll start um, briefly with wind. Um, you know, you've seen 50 years of the internet uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't have thought about looking forward when you, when you started uh, 50 years ago, the impact of the internet. And I know it's very hard to, you know, divide the black and whites of it, but overall, when you see, are you happy with what the internet has achieved? Uh, being very aware that there have been some downsides as well. Uh, and what is your vision for the next 50 years of the internet? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that I could project 50 years ahead, although I appreciate uh, the framing of the question because I'll be dead by the time 50 <laughs> years elapsed. So if I'm wrong, I won't be embarrassed because I won't be around to <laughs> suffer the consequences. Uh, I will say though, that even though we could not have predicted in detail everything that uh, has happened in the course of internet's uh, evolution, uh, I, will, I will argue that um, there, it's unquestionably true that computing power uh, is incredibly enabling. And it, we've seen that power get uh, more and more, you know, grow more and more over time. Moore's law has, has been supplanted now by multiple cores instead of increased clock speed, but capacity has gone up in every dimension. Uh, and of course, because computing has become less and less expensive, uh, you know, per unit of uh, computing power. We put computers everywhere now. And so we hear the internet of things is a common expression. And over time, I think computing and networking uh, will penetrate into every bit of our daily lives if it has not already. Now for half the world's population, direct access and use of the internet is still out of reach. Something that I care a great deal about. I'm sure that over the next 50 years, this kind of capability will be available to everyone readily at reasonable cost, sustainably and safely, which does raise some interesting questions about safety, which we might come to in a later part of our conversation. Uh, so uh, the 50% the that doesn't have access will have access. Everyone's access will increase in speed, almost certainly, uh, and in, uh, in availability. Uh, when we see things like uh, Starlink coming from SpaceX uh, with the 24,000 satellite plan, uh, it will be almost impossible to escape access to the internet uh, after that system is up and running. So I anticipate uh, increased use of the uh, computer and communication technology space uh, for virtually everything, seeing um, as th that the uh, I would say that there are no limits to software. This is sort of a, an unexplored, but uh, infinite frontier. You can essentially do anything that you can figure out how to program. And so I see that as a sort of an unlimited opportunity for creativity and invention. And indeed that's what we're seeing. So 50 years from now, we will still have people inventing new applications uh, and new uses for computers and communication. I just don't know what they are yet. Probably 50 years from now, we may actually be uh, well on our way to exploring the solar system a lot more deeply than we have been able to so far, including uh, people going uh, to, uh, to the planets as opposed to just robotic instruments. Um, but I want to jump quickly to the topic of uh, disability and wind. You have a personal association with the topic. Um, and again, I, I'm very keen to know, you know, there are a lot of statistics which shows that COVID has disproportionately affected uh, people with disabilities and of course the marginalized community overall. Uh, but I wanted to hear what's your personal association with disability and how do you see technology playing a, a very important role 
in kind of making it a much more level playing ground uh, for the, the the marginalized communities. So uh, first of all, um, uh, I was uh, born six weeks premature in 1943. And so we guess that uh, they put me in an oxygen tent because my lungs were not fully uh, developed. And it's, it's assumed that uh, the uh, impact of being in a, a, an oxygen environment, high oxygen environment, initiated a, a sensory neural nerve loss in my hearing, which over time has uh, lost about one dB per year. Uh, I started wearing hearing aids when I was 13, and the hearing aids have gotten better at about the same rate my hearing has gotten worse, so I've managed to stay <laughs> more of this flat. Um, but it, it certainly um, helped make me a lot more empathetic for people who have um, long-term disabilities or even short-term ones, you know, and if you break your leg and you're in a wheelchair for six weeks, you begin to appreciate what it's like if you could, had to be in that wheelchair for, you know, the rest of your life as opposed to a finite amount of time. Everyone has experienced some disability, if, if uh, only short-term, it's like, flying in an airplane and landing and your ears are all stuffed up and you begin to see what it's like to be deaf or hard of hearing. So I've been very lucky that technology has allowed me to participate in the hearing world in a more or less normal way. Uh, my wife has a much more dramatic story to tell. She was uh, born with normal hearing, but when she was three years old, she caught uh, spinal meningitis, which uh, it produced a really, really high temperature, like 105 or 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And it destroyed the ciliary hairs inside of her cochlea, which are the means by which sound is transduced into neural pulses and the brain recognizes that as sound. So for 50 years, she was profoundly deaf. She had to lip read. She didn't learn how to sign. She raised a family, went to, went to college, you know, got her degrees, went to work uh, in an, an entirely silent world. And then uh, at age 53 in 1996, uh, she discovered cochlear implants by going out on the net, which was very satisfying for me and doing some surgery, <laughs> and discovered that uh, the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore uh, had specialists uh, who could do cochlear implants. So she went up to be tested and they said, yes, your, your uh, auditory nerve is still okay. It's just that the little cilier hairs aren't there we could do an implant, which they did. And it was absolutely dramatic. Uh, it, she, it's a 45 minute outpatient operation. Uh, she, uh, she came back to the hospital after a couple of weeks after the surgery and they turned on the speech processor, which is a little thing about the size of a mobile. And within 20 minutes of programming it, she picked up the phone and called me. Now you have to understand, <laughs> We'd been married for 30 years and had not been able to use the phone. And so this was a very dramatic moment. The, the conversation wasn't all that deep, but it was a <laughs> very powerful, very powerful thing. By the time I got home, I discovered that I couldn't get her off the phone. She was a 53-year-old teenager. Any calls that came in were fine, including, you know, uh, people calling to sell, you know, uh, you know products and services. Now, at the time, I was the senior VP of engineering at uh, MCI, and, uh, and so uh, AT&T called her to see if she would like to switch her phone service to AT&T, and so she picked up the phone and said, oh, hello, where are you? And the person said, I'm in Bangalore, and she said, oh, well, that's fascinating. Tell me a little bit more about, so half an hour goes by, and this poor person says, well, now you're going to switch, aren't you? And she says, no, my husband works for MCI, but thanks for calling. And she ends up home. <laughs> that it gets better. Then she decided that because she had been deaf all those years, that there were words that she hadn't heard that uh, she should hear to know how they were pronounced. So she decided to get recorded books for the blind. So she calls the library on the phone and she says, hi, can I sign up for recorded books? And they said, sure, no problem. You know, name, address, phone number. They said, now you're blind, aren't you? And she says, no, I'm deaf. And there's this long pause while they're trying to figure out how to work. She listened to 500 books on tape and, and now she's good at recognizing accents and, and recognizing when people mispronounce words. She also uh, went after an FM transmitter. So when she goes to a lecture, she hangs a little FM transmitter around the neck of the speaker and she can pick that up 150 feet away. She has patch cords for plugging into the uh, movie uh, thing on the airplane. So all she hears is the movie and not the screaming kid that's next door. 
I mean, it's, I mean, she has, she's invested heavily in all kinds of assistive technology. These same discussions, same, same kinds of stories could be told for other kinds of assistive technology. And as you look towards the future, you can imagine ocular implants, you can imagine spinal implants to, uh, to recover sensory neural and motor neural uh, function. So I, I am excited about um, the kinds of things that we can do with nerves and electronics. And over time, of course, uh, hopefully we will also learn how to deal with uh, diseases that are, are caused by um, uh, people who, who have genetic um, uh, mis you know, malformations, I guess is the right word. Yeah. So I am anticipating that technology will play an enormous role in assisting people to uh, cope with uh, daily life. And over time, I watched that technology improve. Ironically, though, computers, which are the most powerful tools ever invented, still stymie uh, people who have uh, disabilities, whether they're blind or, or visually impaired or hearing impaired, we could do better. And I'm sure Rishad uh, and I would agree on a number of things that would improve computer access for people who, uh, who need assistance. And so that's still an area that needs to be pursued. What a what a beautiful story event. I mean, I remember meeting both of you uh, in Waldorf. And one of the things I remember when you said is, my wife has a very magnetic personality. I know that was pun intended because you could stick uh, something on her head here because she had a implant and that would actually be magnetic, right? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a magnet inside of her head which holds the external um, um, device that's delivering the signal from the speech processor also has a magnet. So she literally just connects it to the side of her head. Thank you. I mean, that was, what a beautiful example of what, um, you know, assistive devices can do to people to lead a fulfilling life. Um, thank you so much, Vin, for sharing that. Thank it really you. made a huge difference. Uh, Rishad, do you want to sh share something about, you know, I know Wipro has contributed to so many different areas. Any final message for the audience at the India Inclusion Summit? You know, this is obviously a platform where we want to celebrate people's differences. Uh, so any final remarks or comments on just your personal message or what Wipro is doing in the field of disability? No, I, I think it's a great story, Vin. And I think it really brings out to life both uh, the power of uh, uh, how somebody's life can change with change and the power of technology to make that. Look, at, at Wipro, we've tried to be inclusive on a, on, a, on a bunch of different levels and we're still on that journey, right? Uh, and because we really want to have diversity in every shape and form at the company. And for us, diversity means not, not only that we attract people, but that those people then feel true to truly be themselves and be able to thrive in their own context and in their own environment, uh, then feeling the need to, uh, to acclimatize and change. And so, you know, whether it be in terms of gender or attracting people, you know, enabling people with disabilities to, to work at Wipro to attract, uh, uh, you know, uh, diverse people in terms of ethnicity and then as well as in terms of the social orientation and the whole LGBT commu LGBTQ community. And, you know, it's again a journey that we've been on, but we take it um, uh, very seriously. And it's been, it's been very satisfying. And so today, you know, we have about 550 self-declared people with disabilities who are working in the organization. All our campuses are, um, uh, you know, uh, disability so accessible. Yeah. Uh, and accessible. And, um, you know, and, and we've seen, you know, as productive a workforce as anywhere else in terms of any other kind of person that joins the organization. So we want to be as inclusive and as open to people as we can be. And we, we continue to, strive in that effort. And so it's an important agenda, both at every level in the organization, including at our board level, in terms of diversity and inclusion. And I think, you know, I would just encourage organizations that there are other organizations out there to give it the importance that it deserves, because it doesn't only make for doing the right thing, but I think it also makes for a richer organization in terms of bringing in ideas that are very, very different from your own, bringing in people with experiences that are very, very different from your own. You know, I'll just, share a quick story you know i was a uh, about 18 20 months ago you know when i think about diversity i frankly very shallowly thought about diversity from the perspective of metrics 
And then I had a mentor who told me that, you know, that, you know, I would tell them about when I was recruiting someone or looking for someone that oftentimes I'd be looking for someone who was very similar to me, someone I could relate to, someone I could understand, someone perhaps I could feel comfortable having with a, a coffee or a drink with in the evening. And this person told me that's the completely wrong way to look for people. You've got to look for people who are very, very different from you, who challenge your core, who make you highly uncomfortable. They're highly functional, but they make you uncomfortable. And that's how you bring in richness of ideas. And so we've been very strongly focused on that from a, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, because I think that makes for richer uh, experiences, richer contributions by bringing in people that have very, very different experiences, not only in their professional lives, but also in their personal space. And that adds to the, to the, to the benefit of the organization. So in a, very, in a way, it's actually quite self-serving for the companies to be doing that as well. So I would strongly encourage organizations to think about this and make it an important agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Rishad. On that note, I can't thank you enough uh, for being at the India Inclusion Summit virtually. I hope uh, we get the chance to see you in person whenever you know the world opens up and we get back to some sense of normalcy. Vinsurf and Rishad Premji, thank you so much for doing this for us. And uh, on behalf of the entire community, thank you so much for your time and your, um, your, your thoughts. Thank you. I look forward. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much, Vin. Thank you, Rashad. Thanks, Rashad and Vin, for being champions of inclusion. A movement to make our world an inclusive place will require collective efforts from everyone. And there is a huge part that influencers like you can play. And now, I'd like to invite my friend Inclu back with me on the stage to share his message for inclusion. I dream that we live in a truly inclusive world where everyone can have fun, feel safe and be happy. It's a big job, but if we all work together, it can come true. Will you join me in my journey of making India and the world inclusive? Thank you, Inclu, once again. With that, we are coming to an end of today's event, Ability Unlimited, and also to India Inclusion Summit 2020. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and for other IIS 2020 events and programs like the Resilient Me, IIS Youth, Celebration of Inclusion, the Art for Inclusion, and the Inclusion Fellowship. We'd also like to thank the people with disability, the caregivers, the speakers and performers, and the larger community for inclusion, which includes corporates, NGOs, social entrepreneurs, policymakers, and all the others for joining hand in propelling this movement towards an inclusive India. Special thanks to our legions of volunteers who had made India Inclusion Summit 2020 possible in a challenging year to accelerate the movement towards inclusion. I'm Justin Jesudas. On behalf of India Inclusion Summit, I wish everybody goodbye, aruwar, kudafis, aloha, adios, and namaste. See you in 2021. Bird when it flies doesn't care about its size And airplanes even with their weight can soar across the skies From STEM to arts to sports we have traveled far Even though they said we wouldn't make it Do you know who we are? Meri kaya ke bed kuch alag se hai Na hai galat, na hai sahi Kudrat ke is intizam ka मैं हूँ वो खास तुम नहीं मिल भी जाए अगर एक जन्म और फिर जी लूँगा मैं उसे सौ बार आसमां के पार 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 Everyone is blessed each 
differently than the rest But we all have the zest to live life to the fullest No matter our ability, we all can breathe in life In ways people can't imagine, though obstacles are rife We may not have voices, but we are not unheard Yes, we may seem trapped, but we are freer than birds You may say we're cursed, but we're miracles in disguise And you may try to put us down, but we will always rise कुछ सपने बुने आँखों ने कुछ अपने चुने राहों ने कुछ हसरते बढ़ने लगी कुछ चाहते जगने लगी मंजिले रह गई खुद ब खुद पीछे और हम उड़ चले आसमां के पास